morning. It's my pleasure uh, to be able to introduce and welcome one of our newest faculty members, Dr. Alan Brazier. Alan um, received his MD from UCSF, and then he moved east to Boston, um, where he did his residency at Brigham and Women's Hospital, and then a fellowship in endocrinology at MGH. Um, he worked in the lab with Joel Habner, who is a Hughes investigator, and made really important contributions to um, how hormones regulate gene expression. And he has a broad view of hormones. Transcription, they include transcription factors and um, innate immunity mediators, which is the area he's really focused on for much of his career. Um, he's been very productive, 240 publications and up. Um, he's won numerous awards. He's an elected member of the American Society for Clinical Investigation and uh, was an established investigator of the American Heart Association. Um, he uh, started his career at Harvard and then moved to the University of Texas in Galveston, um, which has some weather challenges as well, a little <laughs> bit different, I think. Um, and he was there basically for 27 years, rising to the ranks to full professor. Um, and in his spare time, he uh, was PI of their CTSA, uh, the Clinical and Translational Sciences Award. And we're really fortunate to be able to recruit him last month um, to become executive director of our CTSA, what we call ICTER. And um, he's also senior associate dean for clinical and translational research. Um, and I should say on a personal note, um, I met Alan when he was a fellow at MGH. I was a, I'd say enthusiastic, but sort of confused medical student. I actually thought I was gonna be a cardiologist. And I spent a month with Alan and attending Gil Daniels. And it really changed my life and I became an endocrinologist. So I'd like to thank Alan and welcome to Madison. Well, thank you for that very nice introduction, uh, Vince, and I apologize for steering you into endocrinology. <laughs> anyway, thank you all for braving the elements today to come and hear me talk, and I'm really uh, looking forward to uh, joining your faculty as well as contributing to the mission for clinical and translational sciences here in my role as uh, director of ICTER. I want to talk uh, today about uh, some work that we've been doing uh, that uh, we think is very fundamentally important in uh, airway remodeling, which we think uh, is uh, an important unmet need in the management of chronic obstructive lung disease. And uh, we, we believe that uh, we've uncovered some uh, interesting pathways that relate uh, the process of innate inflammation uh, to this process of airway remodeling. So the major learning objectives for this uh, session are to understand the relationship of what we call these frequent exacerbations on uh, the progression of chronic lung disease. And I'm going to be quite broad in my definition of lung disease. I'm going to include both uh, asthma as well as uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease uh, quite interchangeably uh, for reasons that uh, are um, scientific in nature that, that these pathways are that these uh, diseases both share a very important element of chronic epithelial injury and repair. And I'm going to uh, focus on some of our studies in which we've uh, approached uh, understanding the role of the epithelium in innate inflammation in this process of remodeling. <clears throat> and then we're going to talk a little bit about how this uh, epithelial uh, response to chronic injury affects innate immunity. So, <clears throat> uh, we know that uh, p patients with uh, chronic obstructive lung disease and asthma have uh, these episodes of periodic exacerbations, and these are, are, are common across many of these things, uh, of these diseases. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, as you know, is primarily an environmentally caused uh, disease, principally by uh, exposure to tobacco, associated with uh, significant epithelial injury uh, and CD8 positive T cell inf infiltration in uh, the presence of activated macrophages in the airway. Asthma, as you know, is predominantly an allergic response uh, and it's associated with this TH2 driven 
uh, lymphocytic predominance, uh, uh, including eosinophils, and <clears throat> is a, a, a disease that's associated with reversible airway remodeling, which uh, is different from COPD, which tends to have fixed uh, airway obstruction. But both of these diseases, as well as cystic fibrosis and bronchiectasis, <clears throat> have a significant component of epithelial in injury and repair. And we think that these might be uh, important in the, in the progression of exacerbations. So what I mean by exacerbations are these uh, clinical uh, points in, a, uh, in the progression of the disease where uh, there's an exacerbation of inflammatory uh, symptoms, including shortness of breath, the production of increased sputum that's associated with reduced lung and fu uh, function, and then frequently also associated with uh, viral infections. And these exacerbations are important because they uh, really uh, have a significant impact on the patient's life. They reduce the uh, uh, ability of this patient to do physical activity, uh, uh, account for enhanced um, at school absenteeism, work absenteeism, uh, reduce the quality of life, and then also are important drivers for hospitalization and unscheduled uh, uh, physician visits. So that uh, these exacerbations are, uh, are associated with a disproportionate uh, utilization of healthcare costs. We now are starting to think that the presence of these exacerbations are associated with an accelerated loss of lung function. So the most, most feared complication of COPD is a, is a loss of this vital capacity. And so there are a number of, of observational studies which have suggested that the presence of, of airway exacerbations are associated with a more rapid decline in pulmonary function. So in a, a paper that uh, Bill Calhoun had uh, published a couple years back uh, was an analysis of the Tenor study, which is a prospective observational study of patients with uh, difficult-to-treat asthma, in which they followed <clears throat> on an annual basis the pulmonary function of these individuals. And so there is a wide distribution of ages, uh, and it was a significant population study of over uh, about 4,800 or so patients. And they <clears throat> broke down uh, the, um, the changes in pulmonary function by age, from, ch from children all the way up to uh, adults, and defined the presence of exacerbation as, as any uh, acute event that uh, warranted a change in the therapy of that patient. And what they found was that uh, any individual that had a single exacerbation during that time had a greater decline in the uh, um, percent predicted FEV1. And this was seen uh, dramatically for children, where children who had a single exacerbation had a significant decrease in their FEV1, as well as adults. So this is uh, one uh, observational association where uh, the, the presence of exacerbations are associated with declining lung function. The same feature has also been observed in COPD in a number of studies. Uh, this one study here was a smaller study, only 109 patients uh, with uh, fixed lung obstruction. So these had patients with a, an FE1 of less than 70% pr predicted and were not uh, reversible with a beta-2 agonist, which I think is what we would all call a, a phenotypically chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And over the observation period, uh, the patients who had more than four exacerbations uh, per year had a significantly decline in their, in their uh, FEV1, <coughs> uh, so that the uh, ones that had frequent exacerbations as uh, defined by more than four uh, uh, exacerbations annually had a greater decline in their FEV1 than those patients that had infrequent exacerbations. So both of these uh, observational studies are, are quite consistent in, the, in the, uh, trying to uh, relate or make the association between the presence of exacerbations and declining in pulmonary function. So the next question is, what causes these exacerbations and how might these exacerbations be related uh, to the uh, declining pulmonary function? And I, uh, I'm really intimidated by, <laughs> by talking about this because uh, I'm bringing Coles to Newcastle with regards to the understanding of uh, viral interactions with, with respiratory disease here in Madison, but here you go anyway. Um, we know that, that uh, viral interactions are a very important cause of acute inflammatory episodes in, in patients with both asthma and COPD. Uh, there are a number of studies in very young children uh, that 
uh, have highlighted the very important interaction between uh, rhinoviruses, RSV, the presence of, of uh, wheezing, and ultimately the development of ATP. We know that uh, a number of studies have, have demonstrated that a, a very common cause of asthma exacerbations uh, can be viral upper respiratory tract infections. In uh, some studies, up to 80 or 85 percent of these exacerbations are associated with the presence of active viral replication. I list here rhinovirus and RSV uh, because these are probably the two more common ones, but this, these are not the only causes of viral re respiratory tract infections. Similarly, adult asthma exacerbations, probably not quite as frequently, but also are associated with uh, respiratory tract infection. Here, rhinovirus becomes much more predominant uh, as opposed to RSV. But nevertheless, uh, these uh, acute exacerbations are associated with, with asthma. Uh, um, acute viral infections are associated with asthma exacerbations as well. Now, there's been a tremendous controversy in COPD as to how much of COPD exacerbations are associated with viral infections. And historically, or classically, it's been thought that COPD is primarily associated with the change in bacterial uh, colonization. But with, with newer PCR techniques, uh, there's been an increasing recognition that uh, there are uh, an important cause of, of uh, COPD exacerbations related to respiratory viruses. And these, this is a very interesting problem that uh, respiratory viruses can be uh, isolated in, as a single agent in uh, maybe up to a quarter or so of COPD exacerbations, something like that. There are mixed uh, viral and bacterial exacerbations uh, in COPD exacerbations as well, and then bacteria cause uh, changes in the bacterial colonization are associated with exacerbations in uh, the rest. Uh, there also is this very interesting finding that respiratory viruses may actually trigger uh, changes in the colonization of uh, some of the uh, important uh, bacterial pathogens in COB, COPD, such as Haemophilus and, and uh, Strep pneumonia. And these may be related to the effect of uh, respiratory vi viruses changing the presence of adhesion molecules that are present on the uh, airway epithelium, uh, allowing for other types of bacteria to colonize and adhere and invade. An important component that I, that I want to stress as I, I talk about more about the pathogenesis of, of viral-induced airway disease is that the, uh, the pulmonary uh, system has a, a, a number of, of uh, host defense mechanisms that vary by the location of the, um, of the airways. So, for example, in the proximal airways, uh, there are a number of host defense mechanisms which involve the presence of uh, uh, mucus uh, and the mucociliary escalator, which uh, can clear particles, uh, <clears throat> as well as the secretion of lysozyme and other uh, types of uh, defenses and other antibacterial and antiviral agents. Further down in the airway, uh, the mucociliary escalator is not quite so important, and the uh, airway uh, epithelium and uh, airway uh, macrophages become what are known as sentinel uh, cells. And the sentinel cells for the purpose of my discussion are cells which are uh, uh, key to detect the presence of an invading organism and triggering a, ho a protective host inflammatory response. So these sentinel cells uh, sense the presence of uh, bacterial or viral pathogens by the presence of these pattern recognition receptors. There's a whole field that's is exploded. There's probably about 12 now of these uh, uh, toll-like receptors that uh, are um, expressed uh, proteins present on the plasma membrane or in the endosomal surface, which are, are key to detect the presence of uh, certain types of, of molecular pathogens or molecular patterns, as well as uh, some intracellular pattern recognition receptors which present, uh, detect the presence of viral or bacterial products uh, inside the, uh, uh, the cytoplasm. These uh, trigger this very uh, potent and robust uh, innate inflammatory response, which produces a lot of uh, uh, different types of uh, signaling def defenses, which are uh, secreted that directly uh, produce uh, antibacterial actions, antiviral interferons, which uh, disseminate throughout the surface of the uh, mucosa to uh, reduce the ability of viruses to replicate in ne neighboring cells, as well as inflammatory cytokines, which uh, bring in other types of activated cells, 
and uh, uh, produce uh, protective immunity. So the number and the types of these uh, sentinel cells are quite complex. Uh, I will be focusing primarily on the role of the epithelium as a sentinel cell based on uh, some of our, our, our studies. And further on down uh, the airway, of course, then the alveolar uh, macrophage as well as the type 2 pneumocyte also uh, pose very important roles uh, in, in terms of uh, this triggering this innate response. So <clears throat> we've talked a lot about these uh, association studies uh, which show that when exacerbations occur, there is the presence of uh, replicating viruses or the presence of bacteria. But that doesn't necessarily demonstrate that those are the cause of the exacerbation. So <clears throat> um, more direct evidence has come through the use of human challenge studies. And, and I, I do want to recognize that um, uh, Dr. Bussey and his group have been really some of the pioneers in terms of human challenge studies uh, here, um, as well as uh, now the group at the Heart, Lung and, uh, Heart and Lung Institute in the University of uh, in the UK. Uh, I'm going to show some uh, challenge studies which have been more recently published um, from the UK in which um, uh, normal volunteers or asthmatics are challenged with uh, uh, rhinovirus or respiratory syncytial virus with the idea of trying to understand what are the complexities in terms of this innate response. So in this particular study, which is reported in 2014, they took a number of uh, asthmatics and uh, normal individuals, and then challenged them with rhinovirus 16 versus via nasal spray. So this was intended to replicate uh, the presence of a natural infection. And what was uh, observed was that these uh, individuals uh, had an, an acute exacerbation. So not surprisingly, their symptom scores went up uh, with the uh, occurrence, with the increased uh, presence of viral replication. And these uh, asthmatics responded much more uh, dramatically to the presence of the rhinovirus than the normal. So we, we see this exaggerated response uh, associated with the rhinovirus. But the, the important finding here is that uh, rhinovirus was sufficient to induce an exacerbation. So this is no longer an association study. We, we have an actual linkage here. In addition, a number of uh, uh, studies were done to characterize the, the types of the uh, innate response, and this is a very complicated uh, 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 response. But the important part that I want to focus on here is that the epithelium is responding to the presence of virus. And one of the ways that they demonstrated this was to measure the presence of IL-33. IL-33 is an epithelial-derived chemokine, which is really important in uh, triggering type 2 uh, and other types of inflammatory responses. So in both the normals and the asthmatics, there was a significant increase in uh, nasal IL-33. They also did uh, some uh, interventional um, investigational bronchoscopy studies in which they uh, took a, um, a swab and they absorbed the secretions from the epithelium down in the lower tract, and they were able also to identify the, present, the expression of, of IL-33. So this uh, study showed that A, uh, rhinovirus was capable of inducing acute exacerbations, and B, that part of this component was the expression uh, and activation of the epithelium. They also demonstrated that there was a potent neutrophil response, and the neutrophil response is something that is seen both in rhinovirus and RSV in infection. So uh, biopsies of the patients with asthma, for example, which were stained for the presence of neutrophils, uh, which appear here in red, show that the neutrophils are uh, invading and they actually enter into the epithelium as part of the, response, the acute response to this uh, rhinovirus challenge. So this is a, a very conserved innate response uh, to the presence of a virus which uh, may be triggered by the epithelium and we'll add some uh, of our original studies to that as well. So why is it that, that uh, these acute exacerbations are associated with the progression of disease? And that has to do with this phenomenon that we, we collectively re refer to as airway remodeling. So airway remodeling is a term that refers to a variety of cellular events that occur in the lung uh, that are uh, associated with this uh, loss of lung function. So one of the very characteristics of, of remodeling is the presence of epithelial injury. So this is a biopsy of a patient uh, uh, that had active uh, remodeling. And the uh, epithelium is ragged. There's uh, some tears in the epithelium. You can see that it's uh, trying, it's hyper, hyper, 
hypertrophic. In addition, there's an expansion of the smooth muscle cell layer, which is another characteristic of airway remodeling, and an expansion of the basement membrane, this lamina reticularis that uh, underlies the epithelium that's also a characteristic of uh, airway remodeling. And <clears throat> so this um, process, it, along with mucous metaplasia, is thought to be some of the cellular, complex cellular processes of airway remodeling that uh, may be triggered by uh, these uh, frequent exacerbations and or viral exposures. And so what I'm going to talk a little bit about, uh, go into some detail, is some of the work uh, that we're doing in which we're uh, trying to understand the presence of, of uh, cell, epithelial cell state changes, uh, which may be as a result of uh, either viral uh, activation or uh, the process of epithelial injury, how they may uh, change the uh, function of the uh, epithelium uh, to produce uh, enhanced extracellular matrix uh, deposition, expansion of a myofibroblast population, which uh, we think ultimately results in the presence of uh, collagen and other types of, uh, of um, fibrous uh, deposition in the airway, which may be associated with the presence of uh, or the loss of uh, lung function in patients with active uh, remodeling. So, so this is a very complex uh, situation. So how, how can we study this, this problem? There are obviously multicellular interactions. There's the presence of host inflammatory responses. We know that there's uh, cell state changes. In order to be able to do this, we, we reasoned that we really needed to have a, a lot of uh, expertise in animal model cell biology, uh, human studies, and so on. So I'm going to digress a little bit to talk to you about how uh, the presence of or, or using uh, translational teams can help us to advance uh, fundamental knowledge in areas that are uh, of, uh, in complex human disease. So taking a step back, uh, we now know that over the last 25 years, there's been a significant revolution in the way that we conduct team science. Uh, so. Uh, uh, individuals who are trained in uh, very uh, in deep uh, areas <coughs> are being challenged to respond to very significant biological problems. And so the way that, that uh, this has uh, changed the landscape is that uh, we are doing uh, research more in, the, in multidisciplinary uh, translational teams. And the reason, partly of the reason that people are using team approaches is that uh, the team science has much greater impact. So this is a, a study that uh, was a bibliometric study of over um, 19 million publications over the last 25 years in the National, Laboratory, uh, National Library of Medicine, in which they looked at the relative team impact. So this is the citation rate of team-based uh, team research relative to that of, of individual research. And so relatively speaking, uh, team-based science is cited more often. In addition, we also know that teams are more productive over time. So some of the large uh, studies uh, centers, uh, translational research centers, uh, such as the Tobacco Research Center, has um, been a, a, a natural laboratory for understanding how well teams do relative to other types of, of projects. And so these uh, trans, um, the uh, tobacco use uh, research centers, for example, were studied by Kara Hall at NCI with regards to the productivity of these teams. And they found that over time, uh, initially teams didn't do as well as uh, individual uh, R01 uh, projects or uh, stacked R01s, which were uh, continuing uh, projects in uh, active investigators' labs. But after a short period of time, uh, teams tended uh, to produce a much higher rate of publications. And so this was uh, a very eye-opening uh, opportunity for us to really push the idea that uh, being able to use teams uh, really will in increase our impact and increase our productivity. So there's a lot of, of work that has shown uh, that interdisciplinary teams really outperform uh, in a number of very significant ways, uh, one of which is uh, the, the NRC convergence study, which demonstrated that teams have a greater impact on society than individual research. I talked a little bit about how team research is cited at a higher rate. Uh, we know that uh, team uh, approaches allow greater dissemination of research findings into the scientific field because of the greater uh, reach that they, the teams would have over an individual. They have higher publication rates. And one of the really fun things about teams is that people that participate in teams have a much greater uh, satisfaction of, of their projects. They get uh, different viewpoints of how projects can be 
and how problems can be approached. And so this is, it really makes uh, team science fun. So at the University of Texas, we uh, developed a formalism for uh, the translational science team. We call them uh, translational science teams. And these, these are an academic uh, industry uh, hybrid. So the academic characteristics of a translational team uh, are things that we all know and, and value in the academic environment, that they're focused on generating new knowledge, they involve, uh, we uh, train new investigators, and our roles are defined by our academic position. However, <clears throat> the translational science teams are actually also working on the development of a new uh, uh, test or a new uh, intervention or a drug uh, for application into human health. And so there's a component of a product development team that's part of these. And if we understand how to uh, promote both uh, product development as well as how to uh, promote academic science teams, then we can help to really significantly increase the productivity and base and impact of our, of our team research. So at, at my work at the UTMB was to then uh, structure our entire CTSA on uh, translational science teams. And so we've grown now uh, and oriented our uh, uh, CTSA to support now uh, 19 uh, translational teams. These involve over 270 scientists and have trained 60-plus uh, trainees. Our uh, training programs are all oriented towards teams. Our resources are supported uh, teams. And then we've also learned <coughs> how to study and follow teams by developing w uh, ways of, of tracking their progress. So this had a significant transformational uh, uh, effect on uh, our UTMB uh, CTSA, and this might be one thing that we, we may want to try uh, <coughs> here uh, as it at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. So <clears throat> specifically, <clears throat> we, we uh, formed an airway uh, remodeling translational science team. And this had uh, uh, a very clear vision. And so all the teams that, that work uh, towards a common purpose are much more effective. And so we worked with the, the leadership of this team to uh, define a uh, vision for the team. And so we uh, were working on uh, the... Um, development of uh, diagnostics to improve the management of patients with asthma, particularly with severe asthma. So the PI of the team is a, is a past trainee of Dr. Bussey's, uh, Bill Calhoun, is an interventional pulmonologist <clears throat> and uh, was part of the SARC program and still active member of the ACORN and, uh, and other uh, types of clinical trials uh, studies. And we had several uh, different representations <coughs> from other types of expertise. Uh, we had uh, some people were interested in, in expert in functional measurements. We had uh, components of the team that was involved in development of tissue uh, uh, knockouts. We had uh, predictive modelers. We had some imaging uh, expertise, and then we also had uh, human subjects recruitment. So we wrote the book, uh, Heterogeneity and Asthma. And uh, I think uh, Dr. Bussey is one of the authors uh, in one of the chapters. This is uh, one of the top 25 sellers in, in Springer. Uh, uh, ebook series. So the questions that this that our team addressed is what is the role of the epithelium in the antiviral response and how is this epithelial injury repair linked to airway remodeling? And <clears throat> can we uh, come up with interventions that might affect uh, this, this process that uh, could reverse remodeling which, for which there is really no effective therapy? So one of the problems that we, we worked on was a very simple problem. This is uh, one of these other respiratory viruses, uh, respiratory syncytial virus, which is a very important cause of, of childhood mor morbidity <coughs> and represents a very significant cause of infant hospitalization. Uh, about a little over 3 million children are hospitalized annually worldwide for this disease. Uh, there is no effective vaccine. Uh, over 100% of children are infected by the age of two. And <clears throat> the characteristics of this, uh, this uh, agent is that uh, RSV primarily only replicates in the epithelium. <clears throat> so these are uh, some staining of some fatal cases of uh, RSV uh, bronchiolitis uh, that Dr. Garofalo and Tim Mulliver had, uh, had uh, conducted, in which they stained for the presence of RSV antigen. And you can see this uh, very red uh, staining demonstrated quite a uniform uh, uh, presence of uh, RSV replication in the epithelium from these kids. <clears throat> this is a, one of the 
the original pathological studies of RSV uh, bronchiolitis uh, from uh, Ahern's uh, journal Clinical Pathology Description. And he also observed that there was significant amounts of epithelial necrosis associated with eosinophilic inclusions into the epithelium. So uh, these were um, um, prior to uh, the more molecular diagnosis, but it was quite clear that uh, there was a lot of this uh, epithelial uh, uh, necrosis uh, producing uh, mucus plugging and uh, 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 the ball valve type uh, VQ mismatches that were seen in these children with uh, severe RSV disease. So RSV <coughs> also has a very significant impact on lung function and some of these studies are now starting to come out. The Tucson Respiratory Study demonstrated that over the 30 years of uh, observation that children who had reduced lung function at the age of, uh, in the first year of life, uh, were ones that were in the bottom uh, um, um, percentile of uh, lung function once they reached the age of 30. So the impact of viral infections on reducing lung function uh, may be very significant. Another study uh, from Finland looked at uh, a cohort of children who had uh, the presence of, uh, that were hospitalized for RSV bronchiolitis, <clears throat> and then they were assessed at 18 and 20 years later. And what they found was also a significant uh, decrease in the uh, expiratory flow rates <coughs> in the children who had uh, been hospitalized for RSV relative to a, a matched control group. <coughs> so they came to the conclusion that RSV infection is an independent risk factor for decreased lung mechanics. So going back to the human challenge studies, back to the, the UK studies in which uh, adults were given uh, the Memphis uh, RSV uh, intranasally, again, to try to mimic uh, natural infection, <coughs> the uh, Joswick group and Peter o Openshaw's group made the following observations, which I think are really quite interesting. So what they found was that a, a, a number of these individuals developed URIs and they developed and they uh, 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 cleared the infection quite uh, quickly. However, when they did uh, investigational bronchoscopy, they noted that the virus, there was evidence of persistent viral replication and uh, inflammation in the lower airways, even though these patients were completely asymptomatic. So the, the virus itself is, uh, actually traveled downstream into the, uh, in the airway, and they demonstrated the presence of of uh, RSV replication in the epithelium doing these, uh, these biopsies on day seven and day 28. <clears throat> so even though these patients were asymptomatic, there were significant amounts of viral replication that were going on. And we know that this uh, epithelial response also is important. Like we observed for the IL-33 expression in uh, rhinovirus, there are also uh, epithelial chemokines which are, can be uh, detected in uh, nasal pharyngeal aspirates of children who have received or had uh, naturally occurred infections. So this work comes out of uh, Roberto Garofalo's studies in which he uh, measured the presence of, uh, of MIP1-alpha, which is an epithelial-derived uh, chemokine, and found that uh, the children that had hypoxia or uh, associated with bronchiolitis had a, as a group had a significantly increased level of uh, MIP1-alpha in their nasopharyngeal aspirates. Again, saying that RSV is an important uh, factor that replicates in the epithelium and triggers this innate inflammatory response. So I'm gonna start focusing a little bit more on the mechanisms of how the virus uh, triggers this uh, innate response. And I'm not gonna go through all the, the data. We've published extensively on this, but we've demonstrated that uh, RSV, un as it undergoes its process of cytoplasmic replication, uh, is sensed by a, a pattern recognition receptor called RIG-I. And RIG-I then triggers a, in, uh, an, an innate response, and one of the critical uh, transcription factors is this uh, protein called NF-kappa B rel A. So NF-kappa B rel A is a cytoplasmic protein. It's inactive in normal epithelial cells, but when the uh, presence of virus comes, it goes into the nucleus, and then it activates <coughs> several different um, uh, gene expression programs, one of which is uh, the expression of uh, the inflammatory cytokines, and it also controls the expression of interferons. It uh, upregulates IRF1 uh, and 5. It also uh, upregulates indirectly uh, this uh, further expression of this uh, pattern recognition receptor, uh, with, uh, a phenomenon that we call the IRF amplification loop. So the cell is able to respond uh, 
to the presence of this virus by making more of this pattern recognition re receptor. <clears throat> so we uh, discovered that the presence of RSV uh, activates NF-kappa B. This is uh, probably about 20 years ago before uh, anybody even knew what innate inflammation was. And then uh, went on to demonstrate that this was an important mediator of, of disease in uh, an animal model of, of uh, RSV infection. So RSV infection in an animal model is not a perfect uh, model for humans, but we can study certain aspects of the innate inflammatory response. So if we expose a, a mouse uh, to RSV, they develop this acute neutrophilic inflammation that I referred to earlier. They'll develop airway uh, obstruction and airway hyperreactivity. And they've also, uh, in certain studies have, that have looked for them, have uh, shown that the presence of the RSV replication induces remodeling and fibrosis. In this uh, particular experiment, we looked to see whether or not we could antagonize the action of NF-kappa B in the mouse model and the mouse lung. So these are gel mobility shift assays in which we're looking for the presence of this activated NF-kappa B in the nucleus <coughs> upon RSV infection. And you can see that uh, relative to uh, uninfected mice, the mucosa from RSV-infected mice uh, has the presence of this activated transcription factor. And we uh, developed a small peptide that was soluble into the airway <coughs> that uh, interfered with the uh, critical kinase that activated NF-kappa B. And so mice that were treated with this uh, inhibitory peptide did not activate NF-kappa B even though they were infected with RSV. And we demonstrated that, that <coughs> the pathology score was significantly reduced when we interfered with the uh, presence of NF-kappa B activation. So uh, this study um, suggested to us that NF-kappa B was actually part of an immunopathogenic response to RSV infection. And part of the mechanism by, that, by how uh, NF-kappa B causes this uh, uh, pathogenesis is by releasing a whole bunch of these epithelial-derived uh, chemokines, which are important in producing a neutrophilic and uh, cytotoxic T cell response. <clears throat> so like RAN, tezeotaxin, all the MIP uh, isoforms, MCP and TCA, were all strongly induced by the presence of, uh, the presence of RSV replication. And this NEMO binding domain uh, completely or significantly reduced the expression of these chemokines. So the NF-kappa B was uh, playing a very important part in the inflammatory response to this uh, uh, mouse challenge with RSV. But it, what is exactly the role of the epithelium? And so in order for us to really uh, nail this down, we, we turn to um, our, one of our team members who was uh, very good at uh, developing animal models. And so we uh, knocked out NF-kappa B in an in indu in inducible way in the epithelium. So this was to use a, a tissue-specific expression of the secretoglobin uh, gene, which is the CC10 gene, which is only expressed in uh, club cells or progenitor cells in the distal tracheal bronchial epithelium, which drives the expression of a Cree lock system. And this Cree lock system was then crossed with a mouse that we had generated, which had uh, uh, LOX P sites in the REL-A gene, so we could knock out REL-A with the uh, e exposure to uh, tamoxifen. <clears throat> this uh, set of photomicrographs just demonstrates that we were able to selectively deplete REL-A in the epithelium. So these uh, uh, tissues were from um, either control uh, or uh, uh, oil-treated or tamoxifen-treated mice, which were then st stained for CC10, which is the cell that makes the, uh, uh, this particular Cree recombinase, which is found in the distal uh, uh, epithelium. And in normal, uh, in normal mice, uh, we saw the normal expression of rel which is quite abundantly seen, but we were able to deplete it in the mice <coughs> Uh, after the exposure to, to tamoxifen. So this became a very valuable model for us to be able to ask the question whether or not the epithelial NF-kappa B pathway was important. And so we uh, then conducted a series of experiments in which we uh, looked for the presence of uh, inflammatory response uh, in response to a TLR3 agonist, uh, in this case poly-IC, or what happens when we expose these mice with the uh, intranasal challenge of RSV. And in both of these situations, there was a significant reduction in the number of neutrophils. So again, this tells us that the neutrophilic response is driven by the epithelial inflammatory response. 
as well as a, a global reduction in a lot of these uh, cytokines, the GCSF, IL-6, KC, and interferon beta. Similarly, uh, when we challenged these animals with an RSV infection, we also saw a significant reduction in cytokines and a significant reduction in the inflammatory response. So the very strong, pronounced uh, neutrophilic response that was seen within three days after RSV infection in uh, the uh, control mice were co uh, completely blocked by the uh, depletion of RELA in the epithelium. So this gave us a lot of very important information that says that one, the epithelium is a major innate sensor for RSV and for other molecular patterns, and that the epithelium triggers this acute neutrophilic response, <coughs> which is important in the disease pathogenesis. So the virus continues to replicate here. The, in fact, the viral, viral replication is even higher here than it is here, but the disease is absent. So the mice don't have airway hyperreactivity and they don't demonstrate disease. Again, demonstrating that NF-kappa B is a critical player in the uh, uh, cause of, of the symptoms of RSV. So this raises the next question. So we know that the very distal uh, epithelium is critical in uh, triggering this innate response, uh, but the proximal epithelium doesn't uh, trigger this innate response. So there must be something different about these uh, CC10 producing uh, epithelial cells. So we turn to some of our expertise in proteomics and we looked at the uh, response of uh, normal upper airway cells versus lower air airway cells uh, to the presence of uh, in the absence or presence of RSV infection. And we uh, developed a method for being able to look at all the secreted proteins and exosomes that these cells produced when they were in culture. Uh, this is a heat map of the over 900 proteins that we were able to observe. And you notice that, uh, so uh, green is a low level of expression, red is a high level of expression, and these are clustered by their expression pattern. So you see that upper airway cells produce a lot of the same proteins that lower upper, uh, airway epithelial cells make. So they're obviously very common uh, cell types. However, lower airway epithelial cells produce some unique proteins, and some, some of these proteins were very immunologically significant. These included uh, TSLP, which is well known to be a pathogenic uh, cytokine uh, important in RSV disease, CCL20, IL-6, and CCL3L1. We validated the expression of these using uh, specific uh, uh, mass spectrometry assays and observed that all of these uh, genes were downstream of the NF-kappa B pathway. So these genes are being driven by NF-kappa B only in the distal airway epithelial cells, which represent the unique sentinel cell of the lower airway. We validated this, uh, the differential expression of some of these uh, in this mouse model. So in this case, we look for the CCL20. CCL20 is a uh, chemokine that's involved in mucus production. Mucus production is, as you know, is uh, one of the characteristics of the pathology of, of severe RSV bronchiolitis. And so we were able to demonstrate that CCL20 was being produced only in the terminal bronchiole and not in the more proximal larger bronchioles uh, in accordance with our uh, proteomic studies and associated with the production of the mucus metaplasia that was seen also in the presence of RSV, which we could detect by PAS staining of the epithelium here. So this uh, gave us more insight into how the distal tracheal uh, epithelium, which is serving as a sentinel cell for RSV infection, can cause disease uh, through the production of Th2 type cytokines as well as the production of mucus metaplasia. So this is our sort of a working model for how we're thinking about the distal tracheal bronchial epithelial cell, that viruses like RSV, which get down into the lower airways, trigger these very uh, unique responses which change the, and shape the uh, immune response uh, uh, in the course of infection. Going on, uh, we also observed that uh, NF-kappa B by itself is non-functional. However, NF-kappa B is a protein that causes, that uh, interacts with a number of other proteins <coughs> uh, in order to be able to uh, change its gene regulatory programs. So these are a series of system biology studies where we were pulling down uh, NF-kappa B rel-A in normal cells and also in cells which had been uh, triggered uh, with uh, poly-IC. 
We noticed that the uh, protein interaction network were dramatically changed as a result of activation of this pathway. And importantly, uh, when the uh, rel -A is anf kappa b is activated, it associates with a number of chromatin binding proteins, which are important in remodeling and gene activation. And so this gave us a lot of insight into how anf kappa b could be associated with this process of remodeling. One of the proteins that we observed was a protein called bromodomain containing 4, or BRD4. And we demonstrated and validated that nf kappa b associated with this protein uh, in response to RSV infection. This is a proximity ligation assay in which we look for the presence of molecular interactions between uh, uh, nf kappa b and BRD4 and epithelial cells which have either been mock exposed or exposed to RSV. The presence of these uh, red dots indicates the, the, the locations where RELAE is uh, binding to BRD4. We could also demonstrate that this uh, association occurred in co-immunoprecipitation assays where we immunoprecipitate with uh, rel -A, and then we look for the uh, binding of BRD4. So BRD4 uh, associates with NF-kappa-B in the presence of RSV, and it depends on the uh, particular activation state of, of NF-kappa-B. So if we interfere with one of its important um, phosphorylation states, it's no longer able to bind to RSV. And in the mouse model, we were able to demonstrate that BRD4 is activated. So in this case, BRD4 is a histone acetyltransferase, which is associated with a unique uh, acetylation at lysine-122. And if we stain these epithelium uh, or lung sections with uh, an antibody to this, we see a very dramatic upregulation of the activity of BRD4. So this validates that BRD4 associates with NF-kappa-B, and it's activated in the lungs of mice that are infected with RSV. So we reasoned that knowing that this association occurred, do BRD4 inhibitors interfere with uh, NF-kappa-B dependent uh, disease? So there are uh, some small molecule, uh, relatively selective uh, inhibitors of BRD4. One of them is JQ1. So we conducted a mouse study in which we exposed mice to RSV in the absence or in the presence of this BRD4 inhibitor. In mice that are normally infected with RSV, they lose about 15% of their body weight, and this is associated with this uh, acute inflammatory response <coughs> that we've already shown is NF-kappa B dependent. Interestingly, the mice that were treated with the BRD4 inhibitor, even though they had RSV infection, showed no overt signs of disease. Similarly, the presence of airway obstruction, which we measure by uh, PEN-H, which increases after uh, one and two days after infection with RSV was completely reduced to normal uh, in the mice that were treated with JQ1. And similarly, the presence of this uh, pronounced uh, neutrophilic uh, response was also blocked by the presence uh, by the treatment with this BRD4 inhibitor. So this says to us that BRD4 is a major effector of the NF-kappa B dependent inflammatory response, but gives us a druggable target. And so we sought to uh, uh, try to explore more uh, about this uh, uh, particular uh, uh, protein. The other thing, uh, important observation that we made was that um, the presence of RSV infection induced the upregulation of a myofibroblast population. Myofibroblasts are uh, specific um, fibroblasts that have changed their phenotype uh, to become very collagen producing. And so when you stain uh, the lung sections for alpha SMA and collagen, you can see the presence of these, uh, these fibrotic uh, uh, fibroblasts that are induced by the presence of the, uh, of the viral infection, which gives us a clue for how uh, viruses actually produce this remodeling event. <coughs> Interestingly to us as, as well, the, the treatment of these mice with JQ1 not only reduced the inflammatory response, but it also interfered with the expansion of this myofibroblast population, which we think uh, is a very salient feature. <clears throat> we also explored the, present, uh, the ability of these BRD4 inhibitors to interfere with TLR3-induced remodeling. So in this uh, particular mouse model, uh, repetitive exposures to poly-IC induces a, a dramatic uh, fibrotic event. These are tissue clearing uh, studies in which we uh, make the lung uh, opti optically um, um, translucent and uh, image the presence of collagen using uh, secondary harmonic generation. So the presence of collagen is shown here in these bright green areas. 
And you can see that the, the effect of poly-IC is to, do, to induce a fibrotic response that tracks pretty much with the large airways. These are associated with the presence of collagen de deposition in the uh, histology as well as the presence of neutrophils, which we were able to see, and the presence of uh, airway hyperreactivity. And all of these were uh, blocked by the presence or by the interference of BRD4. So BRD4 is this major player in both RSV infection and uh, TLR3-dependent uh, airway hyperreactivity and airway remodeling. So we uh, then reached out to our, uh, another member of our team, which it was an expert in medicinal chemistry, and, and charged him with trying to develop ways of, of drugging uh, BRD4. And so what he did was to do a structure-based drug design in which he uh, took the crystal structure of BRD4, and we knew where the uh, histone uh, binding pocket was. And he developed a Pharmaco4 model for several uh, uh, highly potent uh, antagonists of uh, the BRD4, which fit into this pocket. We demonstrated that these uh, particular inhibitors, which we call ZL420 and 454, had uh, complete specificity for BRD4. So JQ1, uh, for example, which is our earlier prototype, is a nonspecific inhibitor, and it binds to both BRD2 as well as to BRD4 with similar affinities. By contrast, our uh, selective inhibitors only interfere with uh, BRD4, and they don't uh, talk to any of the other bromo domains. So this is a, a very useful uh, probe for us to be able to selectively understand what the role of the bromo domains are in acute inflammation and airway remodeling. So we went back to our uh, poly-IC model and we were able to demonstrate that the activation of uh, BRD4, which we detected here by the histone 122 acetyl uh, uh, products, was uh, reduced as, as expected with JQ1, but also uh, blocked by our, our selective inhibitors. Similarly, the presence of this marked inflammatory response was interfered with both of these. Uh, total neutrophils and total cells were also reduced as well. So these uh, data further extended our, our understanding that BRD4 is a major player with regards to the presence of uh, this airway remodeling, the neutrophilic uh, response. And we also looked to see whether or not uh, these selective in in inhibitors interfered with the uh, expansion of this myofibroblast population. And uh, lo and behold, both of these uh, agents really significantly reduced the population of myofibroblasts in these cells. So we think that these uh, now become very attractive agents as we uh, continue to explore them for ways of trying to, to interfere with the presence of uh, remodeling that's uh, triggered as a result of these uh, viral exacerbations. I want to talk, uh, just finish up on uh, a couple of observations which also so show that the epithelial innate response is somehow remodeled by the presence of, of chronic lung disease. And uh, there's uh, a, a number of studies which have come out both in asthma as well as COPD which demonstrates that the, the epithelial injury that's associated with this is uh, related in uh, certain ways to the inability of the mucosa to produce a protective inflammatory response. So this is, again, this, uh, these challenge models in which uh, a rhinovirus was challenged uh, to uh, patients with, with asthma as, as opposed to normals. And what they observed was that patients with asthma had enhanced rates of rhinovirus replication in the airway. And this occurred in the first couple of days, but then uh, the uh, asthmatics were able to clear the virus about the same as that, that of normals. Associated with this was a defective uh, production of interferon lambda. So in the patients with asthma uh, who were challenged with rhinovirus, uh, this uh, very strong uh, upregulation of interferon lambda was reduced. <clears throat> and uh, the, the production of interferon lambda is sort of inversely correlated with the total uh, cold score. So if, if you had less interferon lambda, you were sicker than if you had more uh, interferon lambda. Similar findings in terms of enhanced replication of uh, viruses were seen by the same group who challenged uh, patients with COPD. And here they saw that there was an increased level of nasal lavage virus relative to controls. And then similarly, there was also a, a decrement in interferon lambda. So these uh, data uh, suggest that the presence of these, these airway diseases uh, are associated with defects in uh, the, the interferon lambda response. And this is a, an area of active investigation, which we're going to continue. <clears throat>
I finally want to leave you with the idea that this idea of uh, frequent exacerbations is actually a phenotype. So there's a large study that was a uh, prospective study of COPD in which they looked uh, to try to come up with uh, correlates of uh, asthma exacerbations. So these are uh, patients that had significant decreases in their FEV1, they were adults, <coughs> and um, they defined the presence of asthma exacerbations as the needs for antibiotics. And over the course of three years, what they found was that there was a subgroup of patients that had frequent exacerbations, <coughs> and they continued to have frequent exacerbations over the study period. Similarly, there were a group of uh, patients who did not have frequent exacerbations, and they were stable. And in all of their analysis, the only predictor that they had of the presence of an exacerbation was whether or not they had, the patient had an exacerbation the year before. And that was by far the most informative feature. So <clears throat> I'll leave you with this idea, but I, I think this suggests that there might be a subtype of uh, patients with COPD or uh, with, with asthma that may have an active uh, component of epithelial injury and remodeling. Uh, which uh, might be uh, potentially addressable. So schematically, I want to leave you with the idea that the epithelium is a major uh, sensor of innate inflammation. It responds to the presence of viruses and uh, the uh, uh, viral patterns through these uh, two pattern recognition receptors, TLR3 and RIG-I. NF-kappa-B is a major mediator uh, of this uh, response. We know that uh, NF-kappa-B has to interact with these chromatin-modifying proteins, which may be uh, targets for a selective therapy. And in the process of this uh, epithelial innate response, we also see a lot of uh, the presence of a myofibroblast expansion. And these uh, key cells might be uh, very important in, in terms of the uh, uh, eventual remodeling and lung compromise that we see clinically. So I think I've summarized these. Uh, so the tracheobronchial epithelium plays a central role in the acute inflammatory response to viral infection. We know that these cells produce a di distinct pattern of NF-kappa B dependent cytokines that are really important in Th2 uh, production, mucus production, and also uh, our emerging evidence suggests that they play an important role in airway remodeling. We know that BRD4 is an epigenetic reader that uh, NF-kappa B uses to, to signal. This, we think is a, a therapeutic target, and we also know that chronic mucosal injury produces changes in the innate mucosal response. So I'd like to thank uh, my PO1 collaborators, Dr. Garofalo and Dr. Kazala. Much of the work that was done with uh, Bing Tian and Jun Yang in, in my lab. Uh, proteomics was done by the Sealy Center for Molecular Medicine. Our airway remodeling team includes uh, Bill Calhoun and Masood Matamidi, who helped us with the imaging. Jia Zhu uh, did the uh, work with regards to the um, BRD4 uh, inhibitors. And so I thank you for your attention and be happy to address any questions. Yeah, uh, the question is, and if kappa B has a dual purpose, and of course, uh, we we see a pathogenic role for NF kappa B in the RSV infection, where we see a very profound activation. But it's well established that NF kappa B is needed for normal cell growth and uh, for uh, normal immune function, antibody production, that sort of thing. So we have uh, take so it, it 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 can be both good and bad <laughs> uh, in. RSV infection, it's bad, but in other types of uh, responses, it may be very good as well. So we're, we're taking the point that, and this is borne out by a lot of the studies in which people have tried to inhibit NF-kappa B, NF-kappa B itself is too toxic of a target. You couldn't tolerate in, in globally inhibiting NF-kappa B for any therapy. So we're looking for these co-activators that may be playing only a role in certain of the pathogenic aspects, which is why we're focusing on the BRD4 epigenetic reader. <laughs>
yeah, the question was, uh, are we are we missing uh, some of the therapies by, by using high dose uh, corticosteroids, and, and uh, whether or not uh, some therapies directed towards the epithelium might be useful? Of course, I agree with that. <laughs> Thank you for asking that. Um, we, I, I, in terms of preventing exacerbations, um, I, I think there's two two ways to think about this. One is we might be able to prevent exacerbations, but we might also be able to, to treat the consequences of an exacerbation when it occurs. So preventing exacerbations might be things more related to getting some good vaccines and reducing the in incidence of, of, of viruses. Um, there is some evidence, I think, also that the um, macrolide antibiotics have a reduced, uh, uh, re reduced the incidence of exacerbation. So, uh, and, and these work partly, I think, through act, suppression of this innate inflammatory response. The other side of this is given uh, whether or not somebody has an acute exacerbations where you can interfere with some of the pathological response to that, I, I think that's where these uh, sorts of, where we're going with regards to the BRD4 inhibitors. And, uh, but also, you know, some of the uh, more potent immuno therapy and monoclonal antibodies might also be useful in, in terms of reducing the uh, burden of the remodeling event. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah, I, we definitely, there, there's a need here for uh, working on the remodeling uh, issue. Yeah, the question is whether or not there's uh, any additive effect uh, between the virus and bacteria. We've not done that. Uh, we're, we're just been trying to m maintain a pretty simple study, but that's a very that's a very good question, and I suspect there is. Obviously, bacteria will trigger different arms of the toll-like receptor pathway, the TLR4, which gets upregulated as a result of uh, viral infection. Maybe that the pr the the virus might prime the epithelium to have a much more robust inflammatory response. We haven't explored that, but I, I suspect that you're, you're probably right. All right thank you, Alan. Thank you.